It's time for a Drummer Nation. Having immersed himself in percussion from every part of the globe, Pete Lockett is one of the most versatile multi-percussionists in the world. He has worked with Peter Gabriel, Jeff Beck, Bjork, and Robert Plant, as well as alongside great drummers like Steve Gadd, Dave Weckl, and Evelyn Glennie, to name just a few. He works globally in styles covering pop and rock, free jazz, the classical avant-garde, traditional Indian, Carnatic, and Hindustani music, and Japanese taiko drumming. He has also worked extensively in the film industry, arranging and recording all of the ethnic percussion for recent Hollywood hits, The Incredible Hulk 2, Quantum of Solace, Casino Royale, and Die Another Day. The former Crescent Vanguard series are now widely available as part of the legendary Sabian HH models. HH symbols are traditionally hand hammered into shape and sound by Sabian craftsmen. Each symbol receives between 2,000 and 4,000 hammer blows, resulting in increased musicality, tone of complexity, and unmatched sonic texture favored by drummers in the know for generations. Find out more about the Vanguard series and all other Sabian models at Sabian.com. Sound Synergies Procussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Pedal Lube, the only product specifically designed for bass drum, hi-hat pedals and triggers, as well as all moving metal parts and drum hardware, safely removes grit, grime and other contaminants while protecting against harmful friction wear. Symbol Care, restores and conditions symbol surfaces without strippers or harmful polishes. Stick marks and fingerprints virtually disappear while branded ink logos and the symbol's naturally aged patina are left intact. Wear Barrier is a conditioning formula for all drum heads, rims, and even sticks that prevents excess wear and maximizes sound quality. Every Procussion Care product complies with all USA air quality and safety requirements. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. For more information, including a detailed video explaining the science behind Sound Synergies products, check out their website at soundsynergies.net. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. Growing up in New Orleans, I was fortunate enough to have some of the greatest drum mentors and teachers in the world. Because of this lineage, I'm as passionate about teaching drums as I am about playing and have written multiple award-winning drum books and DVDs. Recently, I decided to modernize my approach to teaching where my students can have access to my latest ideas and I can finally answer all the questions I get about drumming, gear, and more. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did, with the advantage of having me road test the material on hundreds of stages, countless clinics, lessons, and master classes, and dozens of studio sessions every year. Subscribe now and get ready to make serious progress on the drums. Imagine how much you can learn in just a month or two. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Pete Lockett, welcome to Drummer Nation, and thank you so much for doing the show. How are you? Yeah, pleasure to be here, Michael. It's, yeah, it's all good, all good. Excited to come on and have a chat. Always nice to talk about drums, you know. Indeed, that's what the show's all about. And uh, I can't help but detect a British accent there. I know you uh, you were born in the U.S. and you what, grew up in London or England or what? No, no, no. I was, I was born in England, born in Portsmouth in the U.K. and uh, grew up here. I lived in London now for, you know, 40, 35 years. Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to ask you, you have a decidedly world view of drumming and percussion. Did that come, how did that come about? I was by accident, really. I mean, I started off quite late as a musician at 19, uh, you know, playing in punk bands and, and in my local town, Portsmouth. And then, um, you know, moved to London I knew that was what I wanted to do you know music was my was my thing that's what that's you know gripped my passion and um yeah moved to London and uh by you know sheer chance I came across a free concert and it was Zaki Hussain and uh you know that, that was like amazing for me uh, I'd never seen anything like it and then a few weeks later the newspaper came through the front door and had fallen open on the mat free newspaper and there was some uh, there was an advert for tablet lessons so that's that's kind of how I got into it really and once you're into it you know there's no turning back really so you began more as a hand drummer than a drum set player well, no, drum set was the first thing. That was sort of in the punk bands and all that. You know, that's what I moved to London as was a was a rock drummer. That's right. You just you said know, that. and then kind of got into the uh, 
yeah, we got into the uh, then got into the percussion, you know, after that. Mm -hmm. Well, in your music, there's such a, a disparate, eclectic uh, collection of influences. I know you are quite conversant in Indian music, uh, Hindustani and um, Carnatic, and uh, yeah. like Japanese taiko. You have the Arabic instruments, the uh, Latin American stuff. Um, West African and of course North American uh, but centrally unifying that is, is pretty much a worldview of percussion right yeah well you know I don't see you know some people learn a particular percussion tradition and they kind of it, it remains isolated in their in their concept you know so they'll learn Cuban or they'll learn North Indian or South Indian or, or you know West African or whatever and you know for me I can't I can't not see the natural correlations between the between the different traditions and also how some of the different concepts and techniques and music making formalities can uh, can you know interlock and and become like a hybrid um, exchange of of you know you know one thing kind of sparks different things to come out of the other thing you know and I, and not only within the music within the music tradition itself but within bringing together musicians from different traditions and, and putting together concepts like that. So, you know, I'm very lucky to have come across all these, you know, traditions and, and spent time. And, you know, you've got to learn them properly. You can't just, you know, learn tabla for three weeks and then mix it with Arabic after you've played that for two weeks. And, you know, it takes, I mean, I took I took six years out when I started learning, you know, in Indian uh, percussion. I took six years out. I had four four-hour lessons a week. This used to practice all the time. I didn't work. I just ate very simply. You know, and that, so that you know, that's what I mean by getting it down. You have to get something down, and then then you can see how things cross fertilize and what what the, you know. And that, and that extends to humanity as well. How can we how can we you know exchange and you know interact with one another in a positive way? Well, I was going to touch on that. Inherent in your music is a worldview of humanity, uh, or a uni a unifying view, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Well, it's, I suppose in a sense it's a, it's partly a consequence of of coming from London because it's such a multicultural uh, city that uh, you know it's it's you know you're on the tube train and there's people from everywhere you know in the carriage every day and and so you're kind of used to lots and lots of different approaches to to life. I mean, I mean, in Portsmouth where I came from, there wasn't that many different musical cultures. So for me, it was very exciting to come to London and suddenly, you know, see, um, you know, different cultures, not not musical cultures, sorry, cultures generally, there weren't that many in, in, in Portsmouth. And then you come to London and there's loads of different cultures and different, it's just amazing. It's just, you know, liberating, really. I think that's the key. You know, I, I used to live in Los Angeles. I live in the Atlanta area now. And people say, well, what's it like over there? How is it different? And it's not like they drive different cars or different have different clothes or different furniture. It's it's a mindset that comes with a more uh, uh, tolerant and accepting view of all the cultures in the world. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely, uh, you know, I mean, we learn so much, you know, from I learned so much from going and, you know, working in Sudan and in India and, and Pakistan and, and Azerbaijan and Nepal and all these different countries. You learn about their cultures and you learn about, you know, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we're all, we're all kind of the same, you know, we got, we all have the same, you know, desires and, and passions and, and, you know, well, maybe not all the same, but there's a lot, lot of, you know, similarities and, and common ground. More common than different. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Amen to that. Uh, and and one of the things musicians I think do naturally is to try to bring that out, and it's just evident from in all kinds of music. You have all kinds of people getting together to make music, and nobody cares uh, who your daddy is or how much money you have or what religion you are or what color you are. We just yeah. we just come together and play music all around the world. Oh, it's, it's kind of the one thing. It's like it, the the two things that are kind of completely. Um, you know, open to to all the people of the planet are you know uh, music and money. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, you have to money. have both. Um, I, I'm not the first to point out that every society in the world, throughout history, I guess, has percussion instruments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. and and many of them have their own dialogue or language that accompanies that. Um, I've been looking into some of your educational materials, and I don't know much at all about the I Indian traditions, but man, I, I, once you whet your appetite on that, it's, it's like I can't, I'm jumping in with two feet, and it's just so amazing. Uh, yeah. Can you explain briefly their basic difference in their rhythmic 
language as opposed well, to more of a Western the, approach? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing the thing to, to look at, you know, w- with Indian music, one of the things that makes it, you know, different from many other musics in the world um, is the way that the system developed. So, you know, from, you know, something like 600 BC was the first, you know, record of, of um, vocal recitation and clapping time cycles. And I think something like 200 BC, I can't remember the exact dates off the top of my head, around 200 BC is the first time there was actual patronage. So that means that there was someone paying for the development of that art form. Um, now, that, that brings it into an area of two musics that, that are patronized and developed intellectually specifically, other, other than, you know, as, a, as opposed to developing in, in the way of a folk music, which is handed down, you know, through the people um, in, a, in a kind of community type way. When you've got a music that's patronized, um, then obviously it can develop intellectually. So Indian classical music and Western classical music were the two kind of patronized musics of the world, which is why they developed so much, you know, in an, in an intellectual fashion. And the thing that differentiates it rhythmically is the fact that they've, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of rhythms from cultures around the world, they're kind of based around almost like, you know, loops of rhythm. Uh, If you look at the clave, for example, or, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, African patterns or different patterns, they're kind of little blocks of rhythm that are then built upon maybe multi-layered and, and, you know, different uh, approaches done to it. Whereas the Indian system, the approach to the actual timeline is completely different because the clapping cycles um, became much longer and more elaborate. And because it was the voice, it meant that they could develop um, intellectual kind of uh, journeys along that longer timeline um, with lots of different, uh, you know, different systems, you know, uh, mathematical or, or poetic rhythm or additive or subtractive and, you know, loads of different ways of, of actually constructing. Rhythm. And don't forget, I mean, India was, you know, the, the, you know, one of the, the main first centers of, of astrology and, and mathematics. I mean, you know, Arabic numerals actually aren't Arabic numerals. They're Indian. They're Hindu numerals that all, you know, the, 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 uh, the Arabs took them over and, and uh, exported them. The Indians used them, but they didn't really use them all that much in the beginning. And so the, the Arabs, although the Indians invented it, the Arabs saw the use for it more. So it's actually a very analytical mind, the Indian mind. And, you know, you can really see that in the, in the way the music's developed. Well, yeah, I was looking at, um, take the tabla, for example, all the different sounds you can make with your fingers on there are represented syllabically by, by you know, a something you can vocalize. And I, I mean, this is my basic understanding of it. And uh, these patterns, or uh, I guess you'd call them patterns or cycles, are, are vocalized and then played. But then uh, you're taking lots of rhythmic modulations inside of it. Let's say you have a group of three notes, or it could be five or seven, or some odd grouping to Western music, place it over, say, eighth notes, over triplets over 16th notes over 16th note triplets and with the uh the the patterns and the syllables you can sing and play and um is that sort of the correct or am i wrong on that yeah i mean there's so much scope with it there's lots of different ways to compose you know right. theme and variation long theme and variation compositions where all of the variations can only be you know uh, contain the contents of the theme in the in the beginning mm-hmm. there's you know obviously rhythmic modulation as, as you as you said switching through rhythmic rhythmic gears using all of the you know the rhythmic levels you know as actual groove basis so you know mm-hmm. in the west we're common with you know a 16th or single and and do a duple and triple kind of bass, you know, triplets and eighth notes or sixteenth notes. Whereas, you know, the Indian system is, has got actual whole ways of developing, you know, rhythmic material within all of the levels. You know, from, you know, sixteenth, you know, four sixteenth uh, notes to five sixteenth notes, a, a, a quarter note, six, seven, eight, nine, mm-hmm. all the way up. So, you know, obviously people do touch on that in in drum set education and in in Western. Uh, music education obviously in classical music that comes up but in in india it's very much a specific system with a huge repertoire uh, an arsenal of material you know well it's giant and it's highly mathematical and it's and it's infinite it reminds me a little bit of whole tone music in that 
When you first hear it, it might sound almost uh, random, but then you begin to recognize the tone row, the inversion, the retrograde inversion, and you can hear the the form and the structure of the music in a larger sense once you immerse yourself in it. Well, I always compare it to a language. I mean, if you if you don't understand a language and you listen to someone, I mean, it, it doesn't mean anything to you. You don't mm-hmm. know what they've said. You know, it might be a beautiful poem in Russian or something. Right. You don't know what they've said until you've educated yourself and learned the language. You now, know, that, I, I worked I worked with drum set years ago and studied with David <laughs> Garibaldi. He would touch on this. He never mentioned Indian music, but he would take linear patterns on the drum set in groups of fives, sevens, nines, and cross over the bar with them and. Uh, I wonder when you get to the point where you begin, I mean, improvisation is a heavy element of this Indian music. When do you get to the point where you hear it as music and not as patterns? Well, it's always music. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're speaking in odd patterns now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing, there's nothing, um, you know, it's just that it's just what you're more used to, you know, folk music and, and, uh, you know, or, you know, some folk music, obviously go to Bulgaria and and Eastern Europe, then you get lots of odd rhythms. Um, So, I mean, it's always music. It's just, you know, it's it's like, uh, you know, having a a vocabulary of words. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say, well, someone's using this vocabulary of words with, you know, you know, extreme long words with with detailed meaning and when does that you know when does that does that mean anything because they're confusing people that don't understand by using this this you know developed language um, right but you know it's just about if, knowing that knowing that language i understand so you once you are fluent <laughs> enough in the language you're breaking away from thinking this is a group of five placed in groups of six or any well, of know, those metric things that. you're it, hearing the phrasing just part, it's just part of the music it's just part of when you learn, they're the things that you learn. It's just like when you learn mm-hmm. the drum set, you learn a paradiddle, and you learn this and that, and, and the different things mm-hmm. that you would that you would learn. When you learn Indian rhythm, you immediately start learning all this stuff. So it's not like an abstract that suddenly gets, oh wow, now we're going to do something really hard. It's just from the very beginning, you do that. Kids, four year old kids, do it in India. You know, you go to watch, a, uh, you know, a young tablet class for example of, of six or seven eight nine ten year olds they're on fire they're amazing you know not always of course but you know with the with the better teachers and you know so it's not it's not that it's it's hard really actually it's hard it's really hard to play the tablet it's really hard to develop that stuff but it's just a matter of 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 time really learning the language being confer- conversant and fluent in it where you don't think we don't think of words and sentence construction we just speak yeah exactly yeah uh, now, one thing, I, you know, as a, a Western drum set guy came up with, uh, you know, snare drum lessons, classical music, Western music, jazz. When I hear a like a great Cuban, not so much for the Indian stuff, because that's a different nomenclature. It's a different language. But when I hear yeah. other percussionists, I, I'm able to I'm down with the rhythm. You know, I can hear a conga, yeah. a congero or a bongo player and and I can I can I can understand the rhythms but what I can't do and I think I'm bringing this up cuz I think it happens to a lot of guys who start with drum set and want to go to into more of the uh, ethnic or global percussion the sounds are so hard to get you know I can yeah, say there's a high sound a low sound a mid sound you know but but I can understand the rhythms the sounds take a lot of mastery don't you Absolutely, think Absolutely yeah yeah I mean even with the tabla you know it takes um well, I mean, it takes a couple of years till you can, you know, perform the, you know, even the sounds properly, you know. But even then, you know, you look at the slap stroke, for example, on, on, you know, congas or, you know, instruments like that, djembe. You know, that 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 takes a long time for people to get to get down. You know, it does. The other thing drummers look at is that it hurts your hands. If it hurts your hands, are you doing something wrong or playing too loudly or? Yeah, well, it's just you're playing too hard. It's it's not about it's not about uh, you know a violent stroke. It's about it's about the way the tone is pull. You know, you're pulling the tone out of the drum, not putting it in. I mean, that's the crucial that's the crucial concept really to 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 uh, to have in your mind when you're trying to learning these strokes. Same thing we learn with any instrument, I guess. Well, just think how long it takes to get a good sound out of a flute, you know. Or, yeah, it's true. Or, or anything. I know uh, a quote from when Miles Davis was sick and he stopped playing for a while. When he went back, he said, it took me two years to get my sound back. Yeah. You know, we're in the sound business and, and the sound is the critical thing. So I guess the advice to drummers trying to uh, learn these things is to be patient and work on sound. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even 
you know, getting a great tone out of a ride cymbal, you know. You, you get five guys playing the same ride cymbal, they're going to sound totally different, you know. You're talking my language. You know, my business partner is Jeff Hamilton, and we did cymbals together and all that stuff. But I would freely tell him, uh, I can sit down at your kit and play your cymbals with your sticks. I can't get your sound. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've done a lot of work with all kinds of artists, you know, from uh, pop <coughs> artists, Peter Gabriel, Robert Plant, uh, Jeff Beck. You've done jazz work. You've done uh, a lot of studio things w w with, with, with movies. Um, do you pretty much look at it like they're calling you to come and be you and let the music oh, yeah, determine? Yeah, that was the, they were the only um, gigs that I would accept, to be honest. Yeah, because I'm not, I've never really wanted to be like a... a a straight up session player, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. well, it's just something that, that, you know, obviously in the beginning you kind of are in, you know, but for me in the beginning, I, I had the session thing for the big, in the, in the beginning, it was just the session thing. And then, then it was the session thing and the solo, you know, the solo and collaborative works, you know, I had my project with Bill Bruford, with the quintet and started to, you know, tour a lot and do a lot of my own projects um, and at that point, that's when, you know, you start to get known for your sound. And that's when you get called for your sound. And the more you get into doing your own projects, the more it, it pulls you away from, you know, being a, a, a you know, sta a regular kind of um, session musician in, in that in that way. You know, when I, I never even with drum set, you know, I only learn that, you know, often you read, oh, you've got to learn everything. You've got to learn these rhythms and that rhythms. And I never did that. I learned what I liked, you know, because I just didn't enjoy playing music that, that I didn't like, you know, and I couldn't see philosophically, I couldn't see why I should do it other than simply to earn money. And if I want to earn money, then I would have picked a different job where I would have made a colossal amount of money a lot quicker, you know, so. <laughs> you're here on that one. I, I spent 10 years of my life trying to sell uh, ride cymbals to jazz musicians <laughs> and realized uh, as passionate as I was about it, you know, there's limited resources available. Yeah. Now, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, film score guy and I hire you, I would imagine they, uh, when, I mean, they're not going to know as much about that music as you do. Uh, do they give you written parts or, or specific things to play oh. if you're doing a Bond film or something, or are you allowed to improvise a lot? Well, the Bond things were different because, you know, I worked very closely with David. We had a duo at, at, at one point, David and I, David Arnold. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of a different thing. Um, most of the film composers that I've worked with, you know, people like, you know, Craig Armstrong and, and A.R. Rahman, uh, they kind of give you a free hand, really. They might say they want a, you know, big sound or a multi-layered sound or, mm -hmm. you know, they might want, you know, more sound effects here or different, you know, a general a direction, but not really. Uh, very rarely would you get, you know, written parts. They would have written parts there, but, you know, it's it's um, because I'd go in as a soloist, you know, it's kind of um, was was, you know, more comfortable for me to um you know do that and be able to work you know in the way that i was used to working you know well one of the things i learned watching some of your stuff and we'll talk about that in a second is uh, i kept wondering okay this is great how does it relate to drum set and there's some playing examples of you playing like a backbeat and then when called for you can pull these things into it and it sounds so hip on a drum set man yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I think, you know, I think the drummers have got a lot to, a lot to get from this material because it's such a complete rhythmic package that's been developed. You know, like I say, from since 600 BC. You know, mm -hmm. there's this has been you know fine tuned over the centuries, and there's a massive amount of material to gain from it if people can see the system and the material that they can take from it and adapt to the Western drum set. So I think part of the problem is that th people think, oh, well, I don't want to play Indian music and I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to be an Indian percussionist or drummer, so I won't learn it. They don't see that actual, you know, you take all of this kind of material, you play it on the drum set without an inch, Indian instrument and without the phonetics. And it just sounds like, you know, elaborate contemporary rhythm material, you know. And, you know, obviously people like Steve Smith and that are beginning to, you know, kind of develop into some of those areas. But I think as, a, as an actual, you know, mode of developing someone's playing i think this is particularly when you listen to bands like animals as leaders and matt gasker and the stuff that they're playing the compositions that they're playing the rhythmic work that goes into that band you know it's actually you know it's very it's not indian influence because i know matt and i know the band and I, <coughs> but it's 
you know, it's got a lot in common, even unconsciously in common. And, you know, we're thinking about, you know, there's an a priori rhythm kind of in us all and, and an a priori kind of global rhythm, if you like, you know, whether it stems from the heartbeat or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's there's, you know, f- food is food, you know. You know, we cook it in different ways, but food is food, effectively. You know, and I kind of think similar along similar lines with rhythm. That's a good point. Now, anyone could tell listening to you talk that you're a great educator and a, a great advocate of this. Uh, let's talk about your, 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 first of all, your website is petelockett.com. Yeah. Well, I'll put that on the notes. And there's a great, there's a lot of information there, and there's a lot of free lessons there if people want to check this out. Yeah. Um, that, so wealth of information. So you have quite an, a dedication to teaching, don't you? Well, I mean, you? I've, had that, I've had that from the very beginning. I always felt, you know, it's kind of good to give something back. And uh-huh. that was, you know, I mean, that, that site was there. But it's 20 years old now, you know. And there's always been free lessons on there, even, even before, you know, before there was YouTube and, and, you know, before MySpace and before, you know, a lot of the, you know, ed drum education um, sites had gone online. You know, I had a lot of free lessons on there. You know, literally everything is just is just free for people to download the videos that I've even got, you know, there's a, a couple of books on there. There's a, a beginner's guide to Tabla. There's a book of... Uh, uh, inspired by George Stone's stick control, which is symmetrical stickings for the snare drum. And there's literally, you know, thousands of, of sticking eyes, snare drum sticking ideas in there. So, yeah, I just it's just a, to, to give something back, really, you know. Because for me, in the beginning, it was so hard to learn something, you know, to learn, uh, you know, bongos. And then you'd go to a, a bongo player and they, they wouldn't really teach you. They'd kind of hide it, you know. And so, I, I, you know, I feel the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you have some books out. I'm, I'm only reading my notes here. Indian Rhythms for the Drum Set, which is terrific. Uh, Taiko yeah, to Tabla. Um, and uh, I recommend them to, to everyone. They're just great. Yeah, so uh, Hudson, the, the Indian Rhythms one is on, on uh, Hudson. So you're very easy to get hold of. Okay. And that, that okay. kind of goes back to what I was saying about taking the actual system and looking at it in, a, in an abstract way and looking at how you can use those rhythmic units in a Western contemporary way. So that really is a, a good introduction to, to that. You also have a lot of music that uh, you produced yourself with uh, heavily yeah. percussion oriented that, that puts this stuff into play. And I highly recommend those as well. Now, uh, you also have a, an app, Drum Jam. Exactly. Yeah, I, I got an app. I, I downloaded well. that last night. I haven't had a chance to play with it too much. Oh, it's okay. v- very hip, man. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, it's um, uh, the idea came from um, uh, there's an app called Urban Spoon, which is kind of like a fruit machine, and you, you shake it up, and you get kind of three different um, restaurants in your area, in your in your local area. And I thought, oh, what if it was, uh, you know. Instead of with local restaurants, it was different. You have a cowbell and a shaker and a, and a bongo or something, and you shake it up, and then you get different patterns. And so that's kind of where it started. So, um, you know, there are, there are uh, well, thousands of loops, actually. It's all me playing. It's all acoustic audio, so it's not MIDI-based. Um, so lots of loops you can drag into a pan and volume window, loads of effects and, and stuff like that, uh, 60 BPM to 200 BPM. And then there's a set of solo pads that you can um, use, go on and solo over the top. But, you know, they're really good. You know, like a lot of the drum sets are really good and you can trigger them from, uh, you know, from your your ATV electronic drum set, for example, Mm. or, you know, for MIDI um, MIDI device. And and they're, you know, like Johnny Rab's got kits on there, KJ Sorker, Russ Miller, Scott Pellegrom. And they're all really detailed kits, you know, like 30 layers deep each sound. So, yeah, it adds a lot. And there's a lot, obviously, you can export it or you can record all the stuff as WAV or, or you know, MP3, email it, send it to SoundCloud, you know, whatever, you know. Very hip. I, I'm, I'm a little bit involved in that with electronic drumming. I have some sound file and, and MIDI groove packages out there. Uh, and I can't wait to hook this up to your uh, drum jam. I want to make I can sure I got the time. Drum, right. drum jam. Drum yeah, jam. All one, all. And, 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 and have a lot of fun with this. Yeah. I mean, to... that's the thing about it is also it's, it's fun for people, even if people aren't percussionists, you know, with the solo pads, people can just mm-hmm. drag their finger, you know, across the, you know, literally like like that, you know, drag their finger across the screen um, and it triggers the sounds. And, and it, you know, even for kids, little kids and stuff, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, we're reaching the end of this short format. I want to advise you to try to have some more energy if you could, would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the, I got the flu. 
<laughs> you got the flu. I'm not even seeing you at 100 percent, and you're you're just so passionate and so enthusiastic that it's infectious. And I really, I think, I think the listeners all pick up on it. Well, I don't want to stretch your voice any further. We we we've got, uh, like I said, it's a short format, but that I always end by saying, since it is, will you do another one again? We'll have you back. Yeah, yeah, great. It'd be lovely. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Michael. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, and I'll, I'll catch up with you soon, Pete. Fantastic. All right, bye-bye. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols... Sound Synergies, Stan Moore Drum Academy, and Classic Drummer Magazine. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.